All right, so we'll start with uh, discussing the syllabus. So this class is on Sage, which is an open source mathematical software package, which I'll say some more about in a moment. Um, and just a quick summary of what Sage is. It's something that has a mission statement to create a viable, free, open source alternative to Magma, Maple, Mathematica, and MATLAB. So that's what Sage is meant to do. Um, but how it does that is an interesting question. You may have to find a chair somewhere and create it. Okay. That's what people have been doing for a while. Oh, can I grab that one? Yeah, there's one right there. Definitely. Look at that. The last chair. Um, as you can see, it's right here in Condon. Um, there's not enough room in this room. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so I may move the course to a bigger room. We'll see. I did that last quarter. It worked. Usually, it's it's always random. So last time, I ended up in Guggenheim, which was better. Um, here's the course website. It's just a GitHub repository. Who here has ever heard of GitHub? Cool, most popular code hosting site. So the course is there. So you can see, for example, every draft of everything. I just constantly push stuff um, as I'm making homework assignments. Uh, the syllabus, everything is on that website. You can find that website by, for example, going to my website, and then there's a link to the GitHub repo. And my website is wstein.org. And then also my email address is wstein at uw.edu. There will be a TA for the course, sort of. So that's Simon Spicer. He'll uh, be here probably on Wednesday. He's not here today. So he's at the graduate student, uh, prospective graduate student lunch right now. But he's going to help with um, organizing some of the grading and so on. Uh, office hours, they'll be, so first, I don't teach anything directly after this course. So you can ask me questions about the course for a while right after the course is over. Uh, hi, hi. I think you have to just go looking for a chair, because yeah. there don't seem to be any left here. Um, but you can also come and just see me in my office every Tuesday at noon. So that's another time. But often I will uh, do like a screen recording or something of the lecture, and then I have to upload it. I just upload it immediately after. So I'm often just going to be sitting here waiting for this to upload, so you can just ask me questions then as well. Um, I made a mailing list for the course, and I took all of the people who are registered in the course as of last night and then just added them to the mailing list. Um, this is just a Google group, so it's useful for occasional announcements and so on. There's also a mailing list through the university only to people who are enrolled, um, which I haven't used that much because I don't use my own UW email very much anyways. But if you're not on this mailing list, you can send an, you can send me an email and I'll add you, or you can just request to join the mailing list. It's just a standard Google group. Um, okay. Any questions about the technical information right there? So the main thing to remember if you want to find this again is wstein.org, and then just look for math480b, and you'll find a link to this. Okay, here are the objectives. I'll just make this bigger since I talk about this first. Okay, so the objectives for the course are to learn how to use Sage, this math software system that is the main point of the course, and also to learn how to use LaTeX for uh, typesetting, so how to make little formulas using LaTeX, and also some basics of making technical documents using LaTeX, which is a standard skill every mathematician should at least have some familiarity with, um, or physicist, or technical person. Um, and also, in the course of learning about Sage, it's important to learn a lot about Python and Cython, uh, especially Python. It's the programming language that's used by Sage, and it's also just a generally useful thing to learn. Cython is a compiler for Python. The main, so Python is a great language. The main um, drawback to Python is that in certain situations, you can write code that would be incredibly fast if you wrote it in Java or C, but will be extremely slow in Python. So um, some very basic things like you know, do a for loop over some integers and do some arithmetic with those integers could easily be 100 times slower in Python than in C. Um, 
Cython allows you to get around that problem by taking code that looks exactly like Python and then having it automatically compiled to C. So you get exactly the speed of C. So it helps you deal with that kind of Achilles heel of Python. Um, most of the time when doing things with Python, that extra factor of speed isn't important. But if you're going to actually contribute to Sage and write code, say, that other people are going to use, then that extra factor of speed is incredibly important. And depending on what you're doing, if you're just playing around with some examples, it might not matter. But if you're going to do a calculation, um, maybe millions of calculations over several days, it's a good idea to know how to speed up the slowest parts of your program. And going along with this is learning about profiling and figuring out where your code is slow and debugging it and so on. Um, the second thing is to understand how Sage is constructed and how to change Sage. So what is Sage? It's this uh, math software program, um, and it's built up out of about 100 other components plus a big Python library that ties it all together. And so the idea is how, if you wanted to build Sage from source, if you wanted to change anything at all about the construction of Sage, what would you do? So I'll talk about that. Um, and just understanding what the architecture of the system is, because it's a pretty unique architecture. Um, you'll do a project that involves Sage in some way. The project could be writing a paper, but it could also just be um, changing some of the code in Sage. So basically um, creating a ticket and making some change to Sage, addressing some missing feature, making something faster, fixing typos in the documentation, something like that. Um, there are a wide range of possible projects. Your um, project, well, I'll say more about how that's graded, but everybody will do some sort of project which will count as a substantial part of your grade, 40%. And finally, you'll learn how to work with uh, various abstract mathematical objects in Sage. So uh, if you took linear algebra, you will have learned about linear transformations, right? They're like a map from one vector space to another. And they're kind of abstract, but they're concretely represented by a matrix. And so in Sage, you can actually work with an object called a linear transformation. It's this object. It's uh, represented by a Python class or an instance of such a thing. And then you can ask for its kernel. You can ask for its codomain. You can ask for its image, etc. You can do operations with subspaces of a vector space directly as objects in the computer. You don't have to just model everything with matrices like you would have done in a linear algebra class or like you would do with Mathematica or MATLAB. In Sage, you can just make a vector, sub, a vector space, a subspace, take two subspaces and intersect them, uh, add them up, etc. You can do all kinds of operations. And that's just an example. Um, Similar things hold all across mathematics. You can make a group and compute with it and ask questions like, give me all the subgroups of this group, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll learn about some of these things. Um, one thing is there are a lot of classes, like in the applied math department and throughout the university, that focus on numerical aspects of computing, like NumPy, SciPy, MATLAB, et cetera. That's not going to be the focus of this class. It could be, has been sometimes in the past, but this time around, I'm going to focus much more on discrete structures, combinatorial type things, et cetera, not on numerical computation. So I won't talk about partial differential equations or um, numerical integration or uh, numerical analysis in the context of uh, matrix algebra, et cetera. Uh, I'll talk very little about statistics and uh, all that stuff, special functions, et cetera, um, because I think there are plenty of other classes that address these issues. Um, I mean, I'll give examples, but that's not going to be the focus at all this time around. Okay, And also, um, Sage itself is strongest, like the, the part of Sage that makes it Sage rather than just NumPy and SciPy is really the um, non-numerical aspects of the system. By numerical, I mean floating point type stuff. Okay, so that's the objectives. Any questions about the objectives of the course, what you're supposed to be able to do after the course is over? Okay, and the responsibilities, so 40% uh, of your grade will be based on homework, and you'll submit a homework assignment every week on Friday. It's due, Friday, it's due by Friday at 6 p.m., and late homework won't be accepted, and low grades are not dropped. So you have to do every single one of the homework assignments. If the thought of that terrifies you, then you probably want to drop, which doesn't worry me too much because there's so many people here. Um, but that's different than what I've done in the past. So I want you to do every single homework assignment. It's very important so that you get really good at using the software and playing with the relevant tools. Um, the way the homework will be submitted is you're just going to have it in a certain directory 
and it'll get automatically grabbed at 6 p.m. on Friday, and it'll get copied somewhere else. So you don't have to actually physically send an email or do anything like that. It just happens automatically. Um, and uh, you'll have to do something so I know where to look to get the file, which I'll tell you about in a moment. So there is a first homework assignment, which I'll describe in a few minutes, which is due this Friday. Second, there's pure grading. And I say 20% of your grade in the sense that if you do a terrible job pure grading, then you'll lose points towards your final grade. Um, and that will be defined, well, first, you will grade other people's homework. So at Friday at 6 p.m., when everybody's homework is collected, then it's going to be randomly redistributed to other people in the class. And you will get three other people's homework. Not one, but three, all of which you'll grade according to, um, for every problem, there'll be how you're supposed to grade it. So all you have to do is just sort of manually apply the uh, description. But you'll see that a lot of the problems are things like make up a Python function. So one of the problems this week is make up two Python functions that are identical except the indentation's different and one than the other. And they're both valid Python functions. And one of them, and there's a value so that one of them gives, so that they give different values on that value. Basically show how white space is important in Python. So it's a very open-ended question. And you know, it's pretty obvious how you should grade it. You know, it's wrong if they don't if they don't give a value where they're different, or if they give exactly the same function. You can't you, know, you can't tell the difference. Um, so, but on the other hand, you really need to. I mean, a person should really grade it. So, um, so what you'll do is you go through the three other homework assignments and you'll grade them based on the criteria. And your grading is due the following Friday, so one week later, at the exact same moment that your new homework assignment is due. So things are always, there's exactly one thing due each week at exactly, I mean, sorry, there's ex exactly one time that two things are due each week. The two things being your new homework assignment and the pure grading from the previous week. Okay? When your grade will actually be determined based on some uh, function of the three grades that you get on your homework. So it won't be just one person determining your grade. It'll be the combination of the three. If you think that the way somebody graded your homework was really bad, then you can complain and there, they will, um, and then the grader, Simon, will look at it, and if he agrees, then the person who graded badly will lose credit, and you'll get credit back. So, simple as that. If you think that the idea of pure grading is too much work for you, or you fundamentally are opposed to it, then you should just drop the class. Um, I don't want to hear complaints from people like halfway through the class saying, it's unfair, we should be, this is an actual complaint I got once, we should be getting paid we're doing work by grading other people's homework. And they only had to grade one other person's homework. But they're actually complaining that they had to grade other people's homework and they should be paid. So if you feel that way, just don't take the class. Since um, peer review, that is evaluating what other people do is an extremely important part of the software development process. And in Sage, for example, um, every single time somebody writes new code that gets included in Sage, it gets posted on a public server called track.sagemath.org and it's peer reviewed publicly. So every line of the code is looked at, people uh, give feedback about issues they have with the code, and it all has to get addressed before it gets into Sage. So it's just a similar process with your homework. It also means that you're likely to get much more detailed feedback about your homework than you would get if I were just doing the grading. In which case, um, you three took my class last quarter, how much detail did you get in feedback about the homework I graded? <laughs> Not that much, yeah. Because I, I mean, I, I, one guy had to grade a huge number, and then like you don't want to type the same comment over and over again. So it gets kind of old. So uh, you'll get better feedback, and it'll be randomized every single time. So you get three random people, three different random people, just completely random from week to week. So any weird bias will hopefully um, go away. And it's not anonymous, just like the Sage peer review process is not anonymous. So this means that you can't be a total jerk in your grading because everybody knows who's doing the grading. So just be civil in grading. Also, you're going to create a project and that will be graded similarly. Again, there'll be criteria. So you'll look at the project and I'll say you should, or I'll say you shouldn't take off if there are you know, spelling errors and mistakes like that, um, et cetera. And again, there'll be multiple people that look at the project, so it won't just be one person and then your grade will be determined by all of the grades they assign. Um, my experience last quarter, for example, is that students give extremely good feedback 
about other people's projects. Just like reading them, they have a lot of good ideas about their overall structure, going from one you know paragraph to the next, how it all ties together. Um, I and the TA will also pop in and look at things, but the main part of your grade will be determined by other people. There'll be a presentation during the very last week of class, which might be for about three or four minutes. So the entire last week of classes will be presentations. So um, you're also expected to come to class, attendance. Finally, um, here's a grading scale. I will almost certainly assign grades, given that I'm not letting you drop homework, I will almost certainly, I can't imagine I'll actually use this scale, I'll use something that's nicer for you. However, at a bare minimum, if you got 86% of the points, you'd get at least a 3.2, although you very likely would get a better grade than that, okay? Um, I've used this grading scale when allowing you know, to drop a whole bunch of homework grades and so on, but given that you can't, your grades will overall be lower, so this is just a guarantee that you'll get at least this grade, but you'll very likely get something better, okay? But the only guarantee is that if you get 84.5% uh, of those points in the course, you'll get at least a 3.1. Uh, I already mentioned it, but the assignment schedule, oh, sorry, one thing that you may notice missing from your responsibilities is the midterm and the final exam. There are no midterms at all, there is no final exam, there's no in-class uh, exams at all. There are no quizzes, nothing. The only thing that you do is homework and a project. There's nothing else, okay? So you don't have to worry about finals at all in this class. The last day of class, you're done. Okay, any questions about any of this? So here's just a schedule so you know what to do from uh, day to day. So one thing is I want you to create a project on cloud.sagemath.com, which I will, uh, I'm using it right now and I'll give you, I'll show you how to do this in a minute. It's part of the to-do list for today. And I want you to send me an email, or actually send this, send to this email address the ID of the project. The idea of the project is something, I'll show you where to find it when I do the demo of Sage Math Talk. I need that ID so I know how to collect your homework. Basically, I need, for, it's a, uh, a UUID D4, it's a version 4 UUID, it's just some big long string, and I'm going to use that in order to collect your homework, okay? And that's one thing, I need you, I want you to do that before Friday so that I can put a list of these UUIDs with your corresponding name in a file and make it so I can automatically collect your homework. And then on Friday this week, you'll turn in homework one. By turn in, it's just, you'll have it in this project. And then next Friday, you will turn in your peer review and homework two, which again will just mean having it in a certain location, etc. Each Friday, you'll do something. And that's it, okay? And these are the days. And there's no like holidays on any Fridays to worry about. And I guess there's nine homework assignments, as you can see. The last one is due, not the last Friday of class, but the Friday before, and then your pure grading of that is due the last Friday of class. All right, so that's everything regarding the syllabus. Any questions overall about the syllabus, or anything unclear about how the class is graded, or uh, what's expected of you? Surely there's some question. No? Okay. All right, so next, um, I think I'm going to switch the order and talk about, I'll give a quick demo of Sage Math Cloud just because you need to know something about it in order to send me the idea of a project for homework one, and then I'll go on to these other things. So Sage Math Cloud is an online it's a website, which, let's see, let me just, I'm going to switch to, what is it, yeah, private mode, so. Okay, so if you go to this website, cloud.sagemath.com, I 
which um, should be linked to from the syllabus, uh, et cetera. But if you go to that website, cloud.sagemath.com, then you can sign up for an account. So you just click create an account and then type in your name, click create an account for free, agree to the terms of usage, and then you'll have an account. And then once you have an account, you'll do the following. Um, I'm going to close this window. You'll log into your account and uh, this is a fake version running on a virtual machine on my laptop, but um, you'll create a new project. You can call it anything you want. Whoops, that was big. Uh, I'll call it uh, Math480B, my homework project. Click Create Project. Then you wait a little bit and you'll get your project. And then you'll open it and then under Settings, in the upper right, there's something that says project ID. That's the code that you send me in, that you send in an email. Okay. Once I have that, then I know exactly what project you're going to use for the rest of this course for uh, doing homework and so on, or at least submitting your homework. So that's the key thing right there. All right. So that's the key thing I wanted to show you, and then we'll get back to this. So. Make sure that you follow that. Make an account, if you don't have one already, make a new project for this class, and then send me the ID of the project, which is in the upper right under Project Settings. All right, now let's go on to talking about Sage. OK, so Sage is a software project like uh, many others, I don't know, like the famous software projects today. Git is a software project. Linux. It's not like those. I mean, those are much bigger. Um, so it's a project I started in 2004. And my main motivation was I was really frustrated by the state of open source software related to the sort of mathematics I was doing for my research. So at the time, I was a postdoc at Harvard. And I was using, I mean, everything on my computer, for example, is open source except the main program that I used for my research, the most important piece of software to me, which is called Magma at the time. Um, I contributed to Magma by going down and visiting the group in Sydney, Australia, and working with them for months and months over several years and multiple occasions. And I uh, was very impressed by the quality of what it could do. So um, Magma is a mathematical software. It's a piece of software that you type in. It's kind of like a programming language that's extremely well adapted for doing certain types of mathematical computations involving polynomials, groups, rings, fields, uh, matrices, very, very large matrices with exact entries, like rational number entries or entries in a finite field, etc. My research area is number theory, and it was extremely good for number theory. Um, but I wanted, but there's a lot of problems with using a program where you can't look at the source code. It doesn't really matter so much in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, it depends on what you're doing. Um, it's not really you know, that annoying that I, well, it would not be that annoying if I couldn't look at the source code of this web browser. Although, actually, this is Google Chrome, which you can look at the source code of, at least of Chromium um, and Firefox and so on. They're open source. But um, if you couldn't, it probably wouldn't be the end of the world. But it's really frustrating when you do, like you spend all day long doing mathematical research and the program that you're using to do it is closed source. And you run into a bug in a function, or you're just confused about how something works. And the only thing you can do is just try different inputs to get an idea of what's going on, or email the um, authors and hope they'll tell you. But you can't actually just read the source code of the function. And this can be a, a major showstopper. You're pursuing some like highly technical line of research, and you're, you're deep in it, and suddenly you have this stupid wall because the program that you're using is closed source. And this was happening to me constantly over many years with Magma. And moreover, I was seeing this happen to a lot of other people. And in addition to that, um, Magma cost a lot of money. And so I had some like informal deal with the developers that I could get specific copies for specific people. Um, but usually, even that was pretty tricky because it's pretty copy protected. And I would have to write to them to get permission. And then they'd have to make it available. And it, would, it could sometimes take quite a while for a person to even get a copy of the program. So it was really, really frustrating that I had research colleagues and they couldn't even use the code I was writing. Um, so I started looking into starting an open source um, alternative to Magma specifically for the sort of number theory I do, or the number of, the sort of research that I do. And that's where things started in 2004. 
And I looked at a lot of different um, programming languages, and my initial plan was to, at the very beginning, it was to write an interpreter, which I'd done when I was an undergrad CS major. It's kind of a standard type of thing you do in a course. And then I was going to look at open source programs and other things and just start implementing every single thing, one after the other. And around that time, there were numerous projects that actually were working really hard to do exactly what I just described. They decided to write their own mathematical language that would, of course, be better than Magma and Magma's language. And then they were implementing a whole bunch of algorithms one after the other. One of them is called Mathematics, and you can see where it is today. Very not famous, uh, probably completely dead. Uh, it's, so I started that way, and I literally lasted one hour. Um, so I sat down on my computer, and I started looking at the source code of another system called Perry, which is open source, and we'll talk a lot more about that later. And I started like trying to implement functions related to elliptic curves, and I got really, really bored and impatient. Within one hour, I decided that approach was completely doomed, and I gave up on that. And then um, interpreter-wise, instead of writing my own interpreter, I just, so I looked at a lot of different systems, and I wanted something, so I looked at many, many different languages around that time. I wanted something where the programming language looked a lot like Magma's. So it kind of looked very straightforward, uh, traditional programming language, uh, but maybe with nice things like list comprehensions and so on. At the same time, it had to be at least possible to extend it in C without too much work. Because Magma and Mathematica and some of these programs are extremely fast, and the only way you can write code that's really, really fast often is in C. Um, it's just not possible at a high level to write all new algorithms that involve discrete structures, say, in a really slow interpreter. And fast, even if you can get within a factor of three of what you could do in C, or a factor of two of what you could do in C, that wouldn't be enough because all the people that I hoped would use the system, um, they would be like, well, but it's twice as fast in Magma. Why would I bother using you know, your system? And so I, there's, no matter what, I had to be able to write stuff in C, or at least write stuff that's as fast as what you could write in C. At the same time, what an interpreter was nice and easy to use. And Python fit that bill. It just happened to be, at the time, it wasn't nearly as popular as it is today, actually. And it, but at the time, it looked the most similar to Magma, and it's possible to extend in C. So I decided to use it. Um, just a little motivation, by the way, I mentioned here. Uh, having the source code of math software, it's a lot like having access to a proof of a theorem. So I don't know how much theoretical math each of you have done, but um, when you're doing math research, especially kind of more pure math research, you often are trying, I mean, the whole point is, at the end of the day, is to prove theorems. And so you have to try to figure out what you want to prove, and then try to prove it. But um, proof, like when you prove a theorem, it's like you figure out how something works. And the proof is like, it's almost like an engine for how, how something actually works. And often the way you come up with ideas for what to prove is you look at things that have been proved already, and then you add some numerical calculation or random guesses or examples, and make a guess as to what might also be true. Um, and then you try to prove this new thing. And guess what you do? You look at the proof of the thing that's already known. It gives you ideas for how you might prove something new. And in fact, like, what you learn, like, okay, so I skateboard a lot. And what I learn in skateboarding is tricks. I do like, hand plants and all kinds of errors and tricks. In mathematics, the analog of tricks in any sport are understanding really well, like, the key idea of a proof. Because each, so, like, you wanna, if you want to prove something new, you basically understand how something else is proved really, really, really well. And then you apply the same idea to that new thing, and hopefully it works. It doesn't always, but sometimes it does. And then you luck out, and then you fill in all the details. It usually seems really easy when you're doing it, and then you fill in the details, that's a pain, but, you, but it works, and then you prove the new result. And then you write up the proof, and you publish it in a paper. Other people look at it, and the sort of whole thing keeps happening. Um, with closed source math software, it's like that, except every time you come up with the proof, you keep it secret, and you only tell people what the theorems are, and you charge them to use the theorem. I mean, that's exactly what Magma is like, or Maple, or Mathematica, or MATLAB. Um, it's not as much of an issue with MATLAB, because MATLAB's used a huge amount for just number crunching numerical work, where it's, the whole world is just a less theoretical kind of enterprise. But with um, Magma, at least, it's an extremely theoretical, motivated thing. You're trying to prove theorems, and the software aids you in doing so. So that kind of describes well what this issue is. It would just be completely ridiculous, and it has a really bad long-term impact. On the other hand, Magma, Maple, Mathematica, these systems get together well over $100 million a year in revenue. So trying to create something of similar quality to what they're able to create with $100 million a year in revenue is extremely difficult. 
and getting people to use your software when they have the alternative of spending $100 to get this system that gets you know, enormous amount of development done on it all the time is also difficult. So things are difficult. But it was more difficult in 2004, I think. Um, so the mission statement, initially, I just wanted to create a number theory system for me and some of my colleagues, but it brought into making a viable alternative to all the main computer algebra systems, which helps clarify what should or should not be in Sage. Um, it's very broad, though. Um, regarding releases, so Sage gets released several times per year, and if you look at the number of people contributing to each release today, it's around 100. Um, you can look at the websites that are linked here to see more about how Sage development works, what the project is. And now here's kind of a definition of what Sage is. It's two things together. It's A, a distribution of open source mass software and the dependencies of these programs. And B, it's a massive Python library that ties together this distribution and provides new functionality. So um, the traditional way, and I've taken a huge amount of, I guess, criticism as a result of this, but Instead of me just writing a massive Python library and saying, by the way, you need to install, and I just list like 60 different programs that are very non-standard, not in Linux distributions and hard to install on your Mac. Just install all of those. Make sure you get exactly the right versions. I haven't tested any of this, by the way, because I don't have a, your computer. And uh, then once you've got all that, just do whatever to install my Python library. So that would be the, that's the standard approach. That's not what I did because uh, my target audience, the people I wanted to install Sage, mainly are uh, mathematicians, math grad students, math undergrads, and they're not going to install exactly the right versions of a whole bunch of different programs. And we're a whole bunch, is a um, pretty enormous list. Uh, mainly the problem being that a lot of those programs are produced by people that don't care much about like proper, so-called proper software engineering. So, uh, so instead of that, what you get when you download Sage you get this one big tarball. If you get the source code, you get this big tarball that has a recipe for building all the dependencies. It downloads the dependencies, and then it builds them in place in a given in a certain directory. And the things it's building are many of them are not in any Linux distribution. They're very non-standard, uh, but they're extremely important to the functionality of Sage. And so you get one thing that you type make, and then it does all the work of building everything together. Uh, or you can get a binary with everything pre-built. Pre and then second, there's a math massive Python library that depends on exactly the right versions of all these other programs. And moreover, has hundreds of thousands of tests with uh, output to verify that everything's working right. And even the slightest thing not working right really matters a lot with mass software. It hardly matters at all with, I don't know, like a Linux desktop or something where, you know, if the code's slightly wrong, maybe your window gets a little jaggedy, but who cares? Um, with mass software, things being slightly wrong really cascade and you end up with completely wrong answers and things crashing and uh, a lot of things go very, very wrong if your software is even slightly wrong or your dependencies are wrong. So that's what Sage is. It's a distribution and a library. Um, and this distribution is extremely important over the years so that people would actually have any chance at all of installing Sage. Um, if it wasn't for that, it would be nearly impossible to install. It would be like... Uh, video editing software for Linux often is. Has anyone here ever tried to do video editing on Linux? Raise your hand if you successfully edited videos on Linux and enjoyed the experience. So the thing with video editing is you have lots and lots of libraries and dependencies and versions, and if things are slightly wrong, it just crashes. I don't know, it's a total disaster. If you ever try to do that, it's very, very painful. Um, and if you if you don't, also if you look at how Magma, Maple, these systems, they're very monolithic. They have a lot of stuff included with them. Also big video editing suites like um, Final Cut Pro, they're really huge programs, so they're really kind of integrated together. They don't assume you have all kinds of random stuff all over your computer. So that's the idea with this. Um, the overall license for Sage is GPL v3, um, if you care about that. And these are the areas of math where Sage has been developed the most. Number theory, combinatorics, graph theory, uh, exact linear algebra, symbolic calculus. There are probably many other areas I'm not listing, but these really stand out in my mind. Um, it started mainly with number theory, but uh, already after about three years, a very large number of combinatorics people and graph theory people got into it. We have a lot of exact linear algebra because it's important for number theory, but also there's strong interest there. Exact linear algebra 
just means linear algebra where the numbers in your matrices are not floating point. Or anything but floating point. So finite field elements, rational numbers, integers, etc. It's extremely important stuff in um, like cryptography and number theory and all kinds of things. And then just so there is a lot of numerical stuff that Sage can do, partly because R, that statistics program, and NumPy and SciPy, those extremely like, big numerical Python packages, they're all in Sage. Anytime you have a copy of Sage, you can call functionality from R. You can um, call functions in NumPy, SciPy, etc. So there's quite a lot that's there for numerical computing. Moreover, because Sage is just really like when you use the Sage interpreter, you're just using Python. Um, any Python library out there, if you put the work in, you can install it. Uh, by that I mean you might have to install some dependency or you know, worry about versions. But in most cases, you can install any Python library. And there are probably like 40,000 Python libraries. So there's a lot of stuff available. Okay, any questions about what Sage is? You guys don't have very many questions today. Why? Okay, that's probably a hard question to answer. There's no answer. Okay. Um, all right, so next, SageMath Cloud. Give me time. Very well. So SageMath Cloud, so um, the short of this is it's a way to use Sage in your web browser instead of having to download and install it on your own computer. So this is, this can be really handy, but it has a lot of additional pluses, um, as you'll see. Uh, you can tell that I've been very worried about other people getting access to Sage some way or another. That's why there's this big you know, distribution and we test it on a lot of machines and build all these binaries. Uh, but another way to get really quick, easy access to Sage is to use it through a web browser. And um, nowadays, that's becoming, so in 2000, Five, that wasn't really that good of a way to go. Like every time you do something, the whole page would refresh. And that was just like the whole approach to the web. But in 2006, it got way better because uh, uh, Google Maps came out and they showed that MapQuest's whole approach was stupid, where you click on the edge of your map and it like refreshes the whole page and shows you the next part of the map. And with Google Maps, they used some funny hack in Internet Explorer to get content from the server without refreshing the page. Called and they call this whole approach Ajax, and it allows you like move, you know, make changes to a web page without refreshing the page. Um, however, nowadays, even that approach is ridiculously old um, and stupid because nowadays we have things like web sockets, which give you a, you can have a persistent socket connection between the browser and the server, and it just stays opened. And at any point, the browser can, or the server could just send messages to the browser and the other direction. And so everything could be event-based. There's no polling. Um, it's very clean and efficient. With Ajax even, potentially lots of cookies and stuff were being sent with every request. And that could be you know, thousands of kilobytes, and your server would get totally overloaded. Um, but in any case, in 2006, um, motivated by the need for some sort of graphical interface, uh, me and also Alex Klemishaw, who was an undergrad, uh, started developing a way of using Sage in the browser. So it was pretty exciting just trying to figure out how to do little things like you type a command that might take a while to run, it has output as it's running, how can you make it so that the output appears little by little as the calculation runs and you see the output in the browser? I mean, it seems so obvious that that should be trivial to do nowadays, but back then it was pretty exciting getting stuff like that to work. So many people over the years, um, these are the main contributors, did a lot of work on um, a website called sagemv.org slash sage notebook, which is included in every copy of Sage. It's the canonical graphical user interface for Sage. Um, Tim Dummels probably did, he may have done the most on the Sage Notebook in the, kind of the middle. He's, he was a um, 16 year old high school student in the Philippines and he just started working a lot on the Sage Notebook. He did it the most, I think, of everybody total on the notebook. Um, he did an enormous amount of work on it. And Tom Boothby was an undergrad here, Alex Klemashaw, Mike Hansen was a grad student here, and so on. Um, so that was the Sage Notebook. You can use it right now, maybe. It isn't, it's working. So go like that. It's not working. That's the problem with it. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, so it's running on one machine that I bought in 2008. And it doesn't, it's not like I can just, I mean, that machine's really beefy, but I can't just run it on multiple machines because it just isn't designed that way. It's very much a single application. It's one single Python 
uh, process with multiple threads that sits there and waits for requests and then handles them in some incredibly stupid ways. Um, and as you can see, it's not working right now. Just nothing came back. Look at that. That's lame. Um, so motivated by it kind of running its course um, and also some other things, I started SageMath Cloud, which is really a successor, shares no code or design really with the Sage Notebook, um, to make something that's scalable uh, much more so it runs on a large number of separate computers, it's very distributed, there's no single points of failure or anything like that. And I also wanted something that could be commercialized, so the idea being that um, well, there'll be some sort of, right now it's all completely free, but at some point maybe there'll be a way that people can pay for extra resources and that this could then generate funding which could go towards Sage development. So when, you know, random student here, and this happened with students here, say, hey, I'd like to you know, get paid a little bit to work on Sage for the summer, like as an intern or something. Um, this is actually pretty tricky to do right now compared to what it would be if I had, uh, you know, people paying some amount for, you know, kind of extra compute resources at which they on which they could use Sage. So, um, so there's also, it's just, there's limitations about how much you can do to fund uh, Sage just by asking for free money from people and donations. I mean, I've got many donations, but it's just, it's such a small drop in the bucket compared to the $100 million a year of revenue that the competitors have. Um, there's no way I'll ever get close to that via uh, donations. And so on. So there's something called the Simons Foundation. Simons is like one of the, I don't know, 40 richest people in the country, some billionaire. But he's also a mathematician. He was uh, the chair of the department at SUNY or something, or somewhere in New York. And he started a hedge fund, which overall is the most successful hedge fund of all time. So that's really impressive, because you're not supposed to be able to beat the stock market. But uh, he did. And he did it consistently over many years. And then he set up a foundation that funds mathematics. So he had a meeting. There was a, meet, a round table discussion that he invited me to at the, their headquarters in Manhattan, and it was titled Funding Open Source Software in Math and Physics. So I was like, yes, finally, a way to fund Sage. Um, and we had discussions all day long, and at the end of the day, the decision that they made was to fund Magma in the following way. They would pay $100,000 a year to Magma, and then Magma would be free to US academic institutions. That was their solution. They didn't seem to worry that Magma is closed source and uh, funding it like that wouldn't help at all with the problem of, you know, you use some code and you want to see how it works so that you can extend it. Like, you seem to totally miss how using closed source mathematical software is like using theorems where you can't read the proof. So that was really annoying. Um, anyways, I'm frustrated about that. So that's one of the motivations for Sage Math Cloud. Uh, also, there's I mean, honestly, there's a lot of frustration with access to Sage, which I've heard repeatedly over the years. It's hard. If you download the Sage binary, it's like 800 megabytes. And then you extract it, it's like, you know, four gigabytes. It's just like downloading some big, you know, video. Well, it's similar in size to MATLAB or Maple or Math Mag uh, Mathematica, but, you know, it's a big download. I have people that complain that it's you know, too big to download in certain parts of the world just because their network bandwidth is so slow. But also, it's just a pain using up that much disk space, even today. Um, and, and, you, and it doesn't work natively under Windows, which is a big issue for a lot of people. And then once you download it, you have to you know, download it again every few months when it gets updated, which is annoying. There's just a lot of annoying things about it. And plus, when you're using it, you'd want to use it with other people, and the collaboration is, an, is a more modern thing to want to do. So, um, so redesigning Sage and B, uh, well, basically, I'll start at the beginning next time with a tour of Sage Math Cloud, but it turns out you could do a lot more with this new design than you could do with the old Sage Notebook. Like you can do full development on Sage itself. You can uh, program in lots of different languages. Um, you can write LaTeX documents. Um, the functionality is extremely extensive. And um, I'll show you all of this at the beginning next time on Wednesday. Okay, and then. Uh, well, there's a homework assignment which I wanted to quickly show you. So I'll just pull it up on the screen, though I won't have time to really go over it. But here's what it looks like. So problem one, create a LaTeX document. Problem two, create a function 
And then I create another function that computes Fibonacci numbers. Problem three, write a cashier function. Problem four, uh, given, a, I already told you about problem four. Problem five is to solve various problems using Sage. Okay, so it's just a list of five problems to do. You'll want to do these by Friday. All right, so I'll see everybody on Wednesday, and we'll continue talking about Sage.